double act, a selection of plays from the series Just Before Midnight. The Devil to Pay by James Fonnett, with Norman Rodway and Derek Seaton. Have you had in a moment? Only don't try to move, otherwise your car will roll right over onto its roof. Just hang on a moment. I'm trying to get the door open. Please hurry. Something burning. It's coming. There. Can you move? No. No, my leg. Look. Oh, oh my God. Please don't say that. Look at it, man. It's smashed. Look, I'll have to lift you out. But it will hurt. Just get on with it. Give me a hand. And the other one. You ready? Oh, oh, oh. Come on. Wake up. Wake up. Huh? Huh? Oh. What happened? Oh, thank God. Thank please, God. Please, I thought... Saw... Please don't say that. Say what? No, it, it doesn't matter. What happened? Now hold this against your cheek. Huh? You've got a deep cut. That's it. I've got some brandy. I always bring some on my camping trips. No, 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 it doesn't matter. Just tell me what happened. You came around that bend like the devil was after you, and you suddenly lost control. Yeah. You skidded, the car hit that overhang and went over onto its side. Lucky you didn't go over the edge, into the river. How does your leg feel? Yeah. All, all right, if I don't try to move it. Mm. I suppose shock will set in in a minute. I doubt it. Yeah, but after an accident like that, it's only natural that shocks you. I said I doubt it. What are you doing? I'm slackening off the tourniquet around your leg. Yeah. That was crazy of you to go driving like that out here. We're miles from anywhere, you know. I like driving fast. But something caused me to lose control. You were driving too fast. These winding mountain roads are deceptive. Now, where's your car? Hmm? Oh, I hitchhiked here. I come nearly every weekend. I like the mountains and I like the solitude. I feel nearer to God up here. Uh, you don't have to come out into the wilderness to be nearer to God. <laughs> That's a word you don't hear much these days. Hmm? Wilderness. Desert, bush, outback, yeah, but uh, not wilderness. <laughs> well, I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> Very old-fashioned, in fact. Uh, here's your handkerchief back. Yeah, but you need it for that cup. Oh, my God! Oh, you know, my dear chap, I do wish you wouldn't keep saying that. It's healing up. Well, of course it's healing. What do you expect? It's so fast. This is a particularly good body. I often use it. Used to belong to a Spartan soldier. A Spartan? That's right. A citizen of Sparta. He was tough, you know. They used to leave newborn babies outdoors for the night. Survival of the fittest. The owner of this body lost his life in a tavern brawl, so I added it to my wardrobe. See my biceps? Quite something, huh? <clears throat> yes, I think I'd better get you into the tent, uh, out of the sun, <laughs> then try to find help. Oh, I'm happy sitting here. It's warm. I like the warmth. No, no, really, you ought to move out of the sun. You've lost a lot of blood from that leg. The leg's perfectly okay. See, not a mark, all nicely healed. Oh, my God. You keep on saying that. It's hardly polite. Who the hell are you? That's better. What? Bringing hell into the conversation. Wish I was back there, but duty calls. You know, my friend, I owe a great debt to you for dragging me out of that car. Would have been a pity if this body had been burnt beyond repair. <clears throat> I think I'm going mad. Perhaps it's me that's been too long in the sun. They say the desert can play tricks with your reasons. You mean you don't know about me? All I know about you is that you came hurtling round that hairpin in the weirdest car I've ever seen. You lost control, turned the car or whatever it is over, and I dragged you out before it was gutted. And now I'm thinking that it's all a particularly horrible nightmare. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I never thought he'd do it like this. Never thought who would do what like this? James Follett. Who? James Follett. He's a writer, books, TV, radio. Big fellow. Smokes too much. Oh, yes, I know him. I've been in some of his plays. Well, you're an actor. Yes, yes. You've done radio? Oh, a lot of radio. 
Well, that explains one thing. He likes experienced actors in his script. Look, will you please explain what all this is about before I start raving? He should have told you. Or at least let you see the script before involving you. Involving me in what? Uh, I think I'd better start at the beginning. Please. Jim Follett, or James Follett as he's known professionally, is a writer, right? Right. And like all writers, he's always on the lookout for new plots or new angles on old plots. So? Which is not always easy for a writer, agreed? I suppose so, yes. Yes. <laughs> Here's where we get to the awkward part. Are you sure you haven't seen this script? I haven't the faintest idea what you're on about. You see, I'm Satan. Satan? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Satan, the devil, old Nick. I've a thousand names from a thousand cultures. Are you feeling all right, my dear chap? Oh, yes, yes. Don't let me stop you. Where was I? Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. I I'm Satan. Anyway, I happened to meet this writer fellow, James Follett, under circumstances which were somewhat unfortunate for me, but lucky for him. I ended up owing him a couple of favours. Wishes, you know, the sort of thing. There have been hundreds of stories written on the theme. Well, wishes granted by the devil in exchange for a soul at a future date. Hmm? That's it. <laughs> I granted this Follett character a couple of wishes. He wanted the best plot ever on the theme of someone helping the devil, me, out of a tight spot and being granted three wishes. And his second wish was that I play myself in his radio play based on the plot I supplied. Is it all getting rather confusing? Uh, no, 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 not at all. <clears throat> so you're here at Jim Follett's behest to get me to act in this play. Well, I warn you that I don't like my weekends being interrupted, and I'm fussy about the parts I play, especially if they're written by Follett. Yes, you don't understand. You're already in it, right now, at this very moment. Don't be absurd. I'm in the middle of the desert, a thousand miles from the nearest radio studio. Of course you're in the desert. We both are, but nothing is too difficult for me. Jim Follett wanted his play set in a desert with me in it, so here I am with you. It's bad luck that you happen to be in the same place at the same time. Uh, bad luck for you, that is. And a stroke of luck for me, that you're an actor. I hate using non-union labour. Well, why should you care? I have a high regard for trade unions. After all, I invented them. Now, wait a minute. What you're saying is that I'm now in a radio play by James Follett. Hmm? Yes. And in this play, I save your life and you grant me three wishes in exchange for my soul. Hmm? Yeah, corny, isn't it? It's even got a corny title. I've got the script here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. The Devil to Pay. How does that grab you? It doesn't. Yeah, pretty awful, I agree. But there's nothing corny about the twist ending. No, sir. It's a terrific ending which the listeners will love. <laughs> a bit tough on you, though. Can I see the script, please? No, I'm afraid not. No, no, old chap, if Mr. Follett hasn't shown you. Then how can you and James Follett be certain that the three wishes I make will be the three wishes I'm supposed to make as per the script? Hmm? A good try. Hmm. But you're in James Follett's wish, remember, and as an actor, you're bound by the script. The last light of yours is here, by the way. Look, <laughs> see? Then uh, how can you and James Follett be certain that the three wishes I make will be the three wishes I'm supposed to make as per... Hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. You're totally in the writer's power. Every word you utter, every movement you make has been planned in advance by James Follett. Oh, my God. I do wish he didn't use that line so much. No imagination, some of these writers. Surely, in the name of God, I can break out of a script I've not even seen. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean I, I'm an individual. I've free will. I can say and do what I like. Not with the producer and writer watching and listening. I'll close my eyes and count to 50. When I open them, you'll be gone and I'll be alone with my tent. One, two... Three. Uh, make it ten, there's a good chap. Why? It's one of those little 15-minute plays. There's not enough time for you to go counting up to 50. It started with my car crash, which means that we're already about two-thirds through. In less than five minutes, your present life will come to an abrupt and astonishing end. What's going to happen to me? You must tell me. You must. You must. The strength. Give me the strength. <laughs> Mark, goodness, what extraordinary behaviour for an actor. Have you no regard for your audience? Giving the end away now would mean the end of the play, which would also mean that countless thousands of listeners would have to put up with gramophone records to fill up the play's 15-minute slot. I'm sorry. Your outburst is understandable, I suppose. Just a few minutes ago, I was camping happily without a care in the world, and now... I know, I know, it's a cruel world. But look, look, look here. If it's only a play, why can't my normal life continue afterwards, eh? But this is your normal life, my dear chap. Oh, what's left of it? Anyway, I promised Mr. Follett and the producer, Glyn Dearman, realism. I'm sorry, but the script has to be followed. 
Uh, what page are we on now? Uh, yeah, ten. Uh, you better hurry up with those three wishes. What's the point if everything I say or do is preordained? Think of the great tradition of your craft. The show must go on. And you end up owning my soul, huh? Uh, when you're dead, of course. When I'm dead. Can I really have any three wishes of my choice? Well, of course. That's the whole point of them. In that case, for my first wish, I want immortality. There. I've got you. I've broken away from the script. I can tell by your expression. You weren't expecting that, were you, eh? Hmm? Yeah, and don't pretend well, it's I... in the script, because it can't be, because immortality means that my soul can never be yours, right? You may well have a point there. You're damn right I've got a point. <laughs> you should see your expression. You finally met someone who's put one over on you, which means that I can spend my last two wishes on great wealth and the sort of luxuries I've always dreamed of. Well, you've proved one thing, that every plot, every radio play, no matter how carefully worked out, always has a flaw in the storyline. You admit that I've beaten you, yes? I'll admit that you've beaten James Follett. But before you utter your second and third wish, I would advise you to think very carefully first. One man asked for plenty of land and for great wealth. I marooned him on the moon with a stack of gold bars and two hours oxygen in his spacesuit. <laughs> Another man asked to spend the rest of his life surrounded by adoring females. He ended up on an island amid a harem of sea elephants. Yes, well, uh, I shall think very carefully. You haven't got much longer. Well, if I'm to be immortal, I might as well be a young immortal. For my second wish, I would like to have my youth back. Please. Agreed. And the third wish. I'll have to hurry you. There are the closing announcements to be got through. Well, it's a sort of double wish, if that's all right. Yes, yes, yes. So we get a move on. Well, for my third wish, I would like to live somewhere absolutely safe from you and at James Follett, where I'm constantly surrounded by beautiful and adoring human women who wait on my every whim. Will that be okay? Hello? Hello? Where are you hiding? Wh where are you? Why is it getting dark? What's happening to me? What, what are you doing to me? This wasn't what I wished for! Ah! Oh, bless my soul. A baby. Father, father, come quickly. Brother Derek, have you no more sense than to go disturbing the entire monastery during meditation hour? It's your baby, Father. Look. Lamb of God, so it is. Yes, he was right here on the monastery steps, naked as the day he was born. This is the day he was born, Brother Derek. Do you see his skin? And this? Who? Oh. Well, who would abandon a newborn baby in this god forsaken place, Father? Heaven only knows, Brother Derek. Ah, there's a poor little mite. Uh, cover him with your gown. <laughs> That's it. Well, what shall we do with him, Father? None of the brothers have any idea of how to look after a baby. Now, oh, there's a problem. Hmm. I know the convent. The good sisters will think they're in heaven with a baby to look after. <laughs> They'll probably kill him with love, Father. <laughs> <laughs> How would you like that then, little fellow, eh? <laughs> Being looked after by all those beautiful nuns in that lovely convent. <laughs> in The Devil to Pay by James Follett, The Devil and the Second Monk were played by Norman Rodway, and The Camper and First Monk by Derek Seaton. The play was directed by Glyn Dearman.